thanks for coming in tonight. I'm, I'm glad it's not pouring down rain. It was earlier this morning when I came in. My name is Beth Smith and I'm an Adult Services Director here at the library. And I am going to do a really, really short introduction. We have Andy Graham, world traveler with us. And I'm going to let him tell you all of the rest of this story because I think he's going to be more interesting than I am. So, <laughs> without further ado, here's Andy. Thank you. Hello, it's uh, my. Ooh, better be careful here. My name's Andy Graham. I'm uh, I go by the name HoboTraveler.com, which is I'm not really a hobo, but it's I thought it was a fun name, but everybody sometimes thinks I'm uh, th uh, I'm a hobo, so I try to stop that sometimes. Um, I've been traveling nonstop for 16 plus years. I've gone to 90 countries. When I say nonstop, that means I just go country, 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 country. Stop in once in a while to see my parents or something, and then go back on. But I really lived the, the last 16 plus years outside the USA. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'm recording this because I have a what they call a travel blog. Uh, it's kind of turned into a video blog. We I make a lot of videos anymore, and uh, so we got what we call the Ask Andy Show which a lot of my readers, after 16 years, they, I found that they really enjoy just posing questions to me. And this kind of forum is really good for me because it's going to give a lot more questions and a lot of uh, different ways to look at things. Um, I, I'm from Orland, Indiana. I went to Prairie Heights High School, went to Indiana University, majored in uh, philosophy, <laughs> roamed around all over the place, and... Uh, you know, I had many different jobs. I was a real estate broker for 14 years. Used to go over to Lake Wawasee over here, close to here, on weekends for many years. And, you know, go to the sandbar and do all these things, sailboat. Uh, member of the yacht, Crow's Nest Yacht Club. Okay, so I know a little bit about this, but we're quite a ways from Orland. <laughs> okay, so Orland's got about 400 people. Okay, um, I wasn't as far as I understand, we don't have a definite topic tonight. Is that true? It's true. You are the topic. I'm the topic. <laughs> okay, this, this is my first book, and it's definitely not my best book. It was just my first one. I'm a, I have a lot of problems because I'm a very provocative writer, okay? And I get a lot of people angry. And I figure on this first book, you got to be neutral. <laughs> yeah. okay. So it's just a simple little book, and we're selling them for uh, $12 if you want to. It's just a way to help, promote, help uh, support me in a way. Okay, um, I'm a, a blogger. Does anybody know what a blogger is? Okay, it's supposed to be like a daily web blog. And it was used to be, when I first started right after the Iraqi war, see, it's like, uh, let's see, 2002, I started blogging. I wrote 2,000 newsletters before that. But uh, I have blogged over 8,000 times. Okay, that means every day I get up and I do something. So right now I'm doing something for tomorrow. I'm going to make a little video of me. Okay, I'm a National Geographic uh, Adventure, top 10 travel blogger, Forbes.com, top 10 travel blogger. I just got number four in the top 10 USA Today travel blogger, uh, budget travel, top 10 bra travel blogger, and anything else you can think of. Okay, uh, probably 50 or 60 different places. I'm like Guardian Magazine. There's all these it just goes on and on. I always like to say National Geographic Adventure, though, because that's my... <laughs> but it's not National Geographic. It's not big. No, Ge National Geographic's got all these different things. Um, I traveled uh, for 16 years, and when I say that, um, m once you take off, I, I originally left for Mexico, okay? And uh, I thought I was just going to take a like six months off and just relax and sort of vegetate. And then I moved around Mexico a little bit. Next thing I knew, some people came through at the Lonely Planet Guidebook and they were headed south. And I, you know, met a Norwegian girl and I met an Argentina girl and I met all these different people. And I started going south. So I went all the way south through all the countries to Panama, then flew across to uh, Colombia, then went all the way to Chile, went all the way through Central and South America, then after that, I had to really think about it because I 
you know, all through this time I had to figure out ways to make money, right? So eventually I figured out how to make money by, well, they started giving me donations, which uh, that worked really good for a while until I got to become Forbes.com top five travel blogger. Money stopped. <laughs> But then now I, I find most of my stuff with what they call Google AdSense. Um, but after that, I went, I went to all of Southeast Asia, hung around in Thailand and Philippines, and went up into Mongolia, went into Nepal many times, went across Tibet, into China, uh, seen the Great Wall. And I've been to Africa eight times now. So I, my, my country de jure right now is probably not country, continent. Is a, I speak Spanish and I speak uh, French. Je, je parle français. Yo hablo espanol. Um, pretty much más o menos fluent. <laughs> I can get around really easy in both these languages. <coughs> Has anybody got anything they especially want to talk about tonight? Come Let's on. Let's talk about Europe. Europe? Yes. What do you want to know about Europe? Europe's having a great money crisis and problem. Sure. And, and uh, one of my friends who just got back said, Military is walking through the streets with uh, guns. Good. And what? I said, "Is it that bad?" He said, well, "I don't know." Are you calling the Ukraine part of Europe, or? Yeah. We're talking. He was in Paris. Paris. Okay. That's interesting. I've been to Europe uh, about three or four times. I spent about a year of my life in Europe. Um, spent one. What I usually do when I travel, which is different than a normal tourist, is and this is. Um, some kind of confusing because most people are, are saving up their money all year round to spend, spend it for two weeks on a vacation. Well, I, I spend really in one year what a lot of people spend in two or three weeks of vacation. So I, I live on a budget. But uh, when I go to Europe, I, I stayed one time in Barcelona for a month. And uh, I got a room <coughs> in a, uh, oh, it's really kind of, it's like a, they, they were studying Spanish which I thought was quite funny because the Spanish in, in Barcelona is not Spanish, it's Catalan, <laughs> okay? So <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of a funny place to study Spanish. Madrid's a better place to study Spanish. But uh, I spent a, they had housing for students and I just went and stayed in this little apartment, whatever. Uh, Europe, Europe is a, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about going to Europe and spending there is you realize that we have a stereotype about them, and they have a stereotype about us, okay? And we both don't really live up to our stereotypes, right? Because we're all unique, <laughs> okay? But uh, Europe is, uh, a lot of times, has a lot higher unemployment in, in the United States, maybe two or three times. Mm -hmm. I mean, they uh, regularly, they have 10, 15 percent unemployment. And <coughs> the job situation is usually by contract a lot of times, so they contract for a year job and then they work. So once you start understanding the economy of Europe, you realize how nice it is in the United States. And on the other side is, uh, here it's an at-will country where you can fire somebody on the spot. There they, they got them for a year. So there's, there's pros and cons both sides. But uh, why, why, was, uh, why were they police in the street in Paris? I have no idea. Two up? Tu vas parler français? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right now, all through the world, there's uh, what's interesting since the time I started traveling. The when I first started traveling, you know, we had the internet, but it was dial-up, right? And they didn't have a blog. I was writing newsletters, and then you had to buy a, you know, I would actually almost buy a connection in some places and send out the newsletter. And it was a really new thing. But the information explosion that's happened the last 15 years is really interesting because uh, now everybody knows somebody from somebody else, from some other country, right? Which uh, is beneficial, but then sometimes it's too much information. And I, I, uh, <coughs> I actually try not to read the news a lot of times because it's so melodramatic. <laughs> But uh, it, it sometimes is, in America especially, it's like frightening to hear the noise of what they're talking about. Uh, <coughs> but uh, Europe's a great place to go, but the cost of living's about twice, of twice of the United States. I remember sitting in Belgium before it went to the Euro, and I said to my friend Pascal, I was looking at a bottle of Head and & Shoulders, and I go, how much is this? And I go, that's, that's $8, right? You know, for a bottle of what I would think would be a $2 16 years ago. 
two dollars bottle of shampoo and it's like, no you know because it's scary sometimes in Europe the cost and they we, we, we really are fortunate in the United States to have Walmart even though everybody's angry at it half the time <laughs> I consider it one of the wonders of the planet because you can walk in one place and get discounted things and buy anything right um, Europe is uh, a very difficult place to travel um, it's not mainly because as far as I'm concerned they've restricted the amount of hotels there by almost a, a, mono, a monopoly and so there's if you go during this month right now the last three months if you don't have a reservation you can't get a room hire and it just forces the price of the hotel to go up and it's very difficult it's not the type of travel I like to do I like to wander I'm a wonder I don't even get re reservations um, did you stay mostly in hotels or did you do a hostel type thing or well, most of, the, most of the time in the last 16 years, I probably stayed in a thousand hotels, but most of the time I stay in a, a mom and pop hotel. Okay, I, I like mom and pop hotels, family ran hotels. They're a lot safer, they're a lot more personable, and I, I need, because I live on the road, I need things. But in Europe, I will often stay in a hostel. A hostel is a place where they got dormitory beds and a fridge, which they call the kitchen supposed to have it. Ideally a hostel is a bunch of dormitory beds in one room and then they'll have like a kitchen where you could cook your food to save money. It's the idea that we're going to save a lot of money and uh, travel cheap. It's mostly for use but it's it's also great to live in a hostel even even at my age. I'll, I'll be living in a hostel here in Southeast Asia, Southeast Europe because uh, it's a built-in social life and it's a built-in travelers, um, a built-in travelers huddle I call it. But I consider the most valuable thing for a traveler that is a traveler's huddle. That's when you're finding a bunch of people sitting around the kitchen cooking a bunch of eggs or something in the breakfast and they're all talking about the next place down the road. And they're going to give me the hint on the next best hotel. Because I don't really move cities, I move hotels. So when, when I figure out the next hotel to go to, I go to it. So I'm always bouncing hotel. And I, I won't leave hardly until I know which hotel I'm going to or at least have two or three options. But the, the bad part about a hostel in Europe is uh, they really rate hostels in Europe on which one's the best party. So when your kids are over there, <laughs> <laughs> be worried. <laughs> I mean, they are a party. They, you, if, you, if you ever go stay in a hostel in Europe, don't get the top rated one. That means it's a party hostel. Okay, that means you want to go down a little. Okay, because anything that's got high, high ratings means that all the kids are having the biggest party of their lives there and you're not going to be able to sleep and they're going to be coming in all night long and they're not going to be behaving but they're going to love it right and uh but uh you know they're all they're on a 20 day 30 day just see as many countries as they can do as much as they can and you know which can i also always recommend if you see your kids go do buy the euro pass because when they don't have a place to sleep they can sleep on the on the train which is really, I've actually slept in the train in Europe. I was going between uh, Sinkel something in Italy <coughs> to Austria. Ended up sleeping on the train because I just couldn't find a room in the, in the place where I was at. Uh, it was just nothing to be found. And I was talking to these three girls. I said, where are you sleeping? And they're, oh, we'll just walk around. And I go, you know, but uh, I stay in hostels. But y if you do go to Europe, if you go outside any of the cities that are not, uh, oh, what do you call it, tourist trap type situations, there's often little hotels that are mom and pop that are just really beautiful. I stayed in Tutichen, uh, Germany one time and I was just, <coughs> I love this place. It was 22 euros a night. She had the best breakfast, you know, they put granola with uh, yogurt on top of granola and they give you, it's a German, I mean these guys can really, she had a Wonderful room, and I, I was seeing my friend Sabine that I'd met in uh, Thailand. Uh, we actually killed a pelican together. It was kind of a weird situation. <laughs> <laughs> the pelican was broke, had a broken wing, and she wanted to put it out of its ministry. And I said, "Oh, come on, you're not serious." And I said, "Okay." I, I knew I was a farm boy, and I just knew, didn't think that she really meant it. Cause, but we did that together. But I, she lived in Seitz in Germany. But Germany's a very nice country. Um, I 
I just gave a speech the other night in Angola about uh, how to retire abroad. And I, if anybody has any questions about this, I would really consider myself uh, quite an expert on this. The reason is because if you ever actually decide that you're going to go live abroad for six months or three months or something like that, <coughs> uh, it's really difficult to compare the countries, right? And I, can, I actually, you know, I've been to 90 countries, so it's uh, one of my expertise. Um, and because at the end of the day, the difference between me and a tourist, okay, or even a tourist, a travel writer, is I don't, I live in the countries. I, I, I'm living there, I'm eating their food, I'm trying to, I have to buy things like normal things, like I might, you know, a camera might break and buy a new camera or whatever, or anything, anything you do is, uh, with living, I do in these countries, which is, most people who are on, on vacation, they buy everything and then they're only thinking about souvenirs. Me, I'm only, I, I don't buy any souvenirs because I only have a backpack, right? Can't carry these things for, you know, ten countries. But uh, I'm a real uh, knowledgeable about uh, how to choose places. Like, um, I, I will say that one of the things that I, I see the biggest problems on travelers or tourism in the planet is they're, they're traveling according to a, a review. And you shouldn't travel to what, what somebody else is doing. You need to travel with, to what you are. If, you know, you're a unique person, right? So one person likes to play golf, the other person likes to surf, the other person wants to sing, the other one... I, I, I bring up an example the other night, uh, Richard Logan, a friend of mine, uh, he was an attorney in Fort Wayne, and he, he's dead now, but he was a good friend of mine, and he always would be talking about his orchids. And I just came back from Vilcabamba, Ecuador, and they have orchids there. And he, he, I was talking to the guy, he says, oh yeah, tell me who your friend was. I had to think, what's his name, Richard? But uh, what an excellent reason to travel. I mean, to go search his passion, okay? And if you really get a hold of your passions and things that you really are interested in, it's much more interesting to go maybe hunt for the author that you really like to, you know, like F. Scott, just sit, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway hanging around in Paris, right? <laughs> they were roaming around Somerset Lawn and all these guys. And this is a much better way to travel than just because uh, the newspaper said this is a great place to go to. Because then you have a built-in subject that you're following. Um, I, I do... I also always like to try to encourage people to travel for a month at a time and not travel for a week. Because once you get by the first uh, t five days of a trip, that's when the trip, that's when the, you start to enjoy a place. Because the first five days of any place I ever go is just like business days, I call them. It's just things I got to do and things I uh, have to perform. Anybody here been to Thailand? Go ahead. No, but I have a question for you. If, if I were to go to a, either a French village or an Italian village for a month, yeah. what would you recommend? Well, you know, you got to, you know, I was a real estate broker for 14 <coughs> years, and one of the things, you, if you really study a map, if you really look at it, and I mean, sometimes you see travelers just looking at it, and you think, well, what are you looking at? But you just look at it, and after a while, everything starts to make sense. You say, well, Paris is up here. And then Southern Europe here, and Southern France is here, the Mediterranean Sea is over here, and then you go, wait a minute, that would be nice to go to the ocean. And things start popping in your head. So the best way to do this is to study the map. Like I was going to go stay, stay in, I want to stay in this little village, it's a college town. College towns are funner than other towns because they're a little more, I don't know, educational in a way. And I need to, I need, I learned French in Africa. And so I'm sure I'm talking with the African accent, which is when I go to Spain, they go, <coughs> Mexico, because they go, Mexico. They hear my, I roll the R's, you know, Arita, you know, and I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> don't roll your R's, because only like two countries on the planet roll their R's. But I don't really want to be known as the African French speaker. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but I've been in Africa almost uh, two years of my life speaking French. So, but the way I would do it is I would study the map. And then you're going to, if you're thinking of it from a real estate value, is the center of a city is the most expensive place, right? So and the bigger the city, the more expensive it is. And so you've got to also do this around your budget, right? 
So, because everybody has a budget, and I don't care what they do, even a millionaire's got a limit. I, you know, they can go to Monaco or whatever, but, you know, they're not going to probably, you know, they, they've got to do it. But study the map. And then, <coughs> once, once you study the map, one of the great things you can do now with, like, Facebook is you can get on there and, and say, Facebook uh, Marseille, okay, or Brittany, that little enclave on the side or something, or Paris. And then I was going to go to, where was that? I was just north of the thing. I was, but you can get, you could say, write the name of the word and then say expats or something like that. The word expat meaning expatriate, which means people that live there. And they'll have these little forums uh, on Facebook now, very common, real easy to find. And you can join these things and you can start learning about the place for, and see if they're the type of people that you would like to do. Then you might even become friends with one of those. And then you got a natural in to go to the place. Now Paris, uh, the the best, you know, everywhere on the planet there's cheap places to live. So to stay for a month is a little more difficult. So in anywhere in the summer months in Europe is is high tourist season. Like right now, I'm going to go to Europe in September. Why? It's almost over. <laughs> okay. I don't like to be in the, the you know, the, the rush. So, but I spent two months in Ecuador just so I could delay it long enough so I could go to Europe in September. And then I'll spend September, October, November, December there in Europe. But then it gets too cold. <laughs> okay. There's a problem because Europe's about the same height as Canada. It's a real small place too. Europe is not big. It's, you can probably get on a train and go all the way across it in one day. Um, it's sometimes we have it a bigger image than we do it, but I would study the map and start thinking and then try to find a place and then a great way to do it is come to the library, uh, look for the Lonely Planet guidebook or Rough Guides guidebook or Let's Go guidebook or Frommers. Frommers and folders are going to be the expensive version of guidebooks and then you got your Lonely Planet which is the, the Backpacker's Bible and just look through it and see what the prices are in your price range. I just wonder if there's still like an authentic Italian village where I can stay and oh, be part of the village. I'm, I'm sure there is. And but you you got to study if you really want to know how Italian in France or in Italy. Well, I figured either going to it. Well, Italy would be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, southern, southern, uh, southern Switzerland's Italian, Italy's Italian, then there's, of course, it bleeds across all over. But, um, a lot of the street names and stuff would tell you, but uh, you know, there's well, search for the name of the village and click on images, and you'd see all the architecture. Uh, you said architecture, Paris, Paris, and then you click on it, you will see all the types of buildings. And but you can understand if you're looking for a little authentic village, that means there's no immigration. Um, Immigration or emigration, where you want to call it, there's two words here, immigration, emigration. I never quite understand the difference. Uh, changes things. So, uh, like, Orlin is what they call, like, a, it's a very conservative thing because all the young people move away. So it's a very authentic little Midwestern town. So this, a city that's not growing would be more authentic than a, than a one that's constantly changing. And, you know, they put the superhighway through the center of it. Any other question? Oh, yeah. If you were to retire, where would you go? And uh, what's your favorite place to go to? Okay. Being that I just gave a lecture on this the other day, I'm, I'm a little <coughs> better about this question. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have a list here. I, I made sure. When you're, when you're retiring abroad, you, got, you can go uphill or downhill. When I say uphill, that's going to Europe. That means the cost is going to go up. You can go downhill, which means the cost is going to go down. So any 225 countries is downhill. 25 countries on the planet is uphill. You're going to go into more expensive. That's going to be a celebration of wealth retirement. Uh, but going downhill, I. But for me, what I like is countries that have. Uh, I, I like. I don't choose countries. I choose cities. Okay because you can't retire in Ecuador, you can't retire in Panama, you can't retire in Thailand. You have to choose a city. You don't go retire in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, you, you Albuquerque, New Mexico, yes, but you don't retire in 
New Mexico, you retire in Albuquerque. There's always a, a town that you're doing. So you have to start searching for towns. And I, I've got a list of here of which I always try to tell people there's there's places in the tropics, which is 23 and a half degrees above the equator to 23 and a half degrees below the equator. And if you go up to 5,000 feet in any of these places and there's a city, it's paradise. The climate is perfect. Mm -hmm. And it took me years, it took me 10 years before I put it all through my head. I said, why is this place so wonderful? And I said, because there's no furnaces and there's no air conditioning. And when you have fresh air all day long and none of this conditioned air, it's paradise. Uh, the places that are like this, and if, if you read like USA Today, they'll say all these places to retire. And a lot of them are addressing some of these places, like uh, Boquete, Panama. That's a place at 1,100 uh, 1, meters. It's a little co uh, warmer there. Medellin, Colombia, Lake Atalan, Guatemala, Baguio, Philippines, Awasa, Ethiopia, one of my favorite places. I know you're all ready to go, right? <laughs> I love Ethiopia. Okay, Lake uh, Chapala in Mexico. It's uh, these are all at, at paradise climates. Oaxaca, 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 Mexico, and Antigua, Guatemala. These are places off the list of places that I have discovered. Um, I just came from Vilcabamba because I wanted to see if it was paradise. It's paradise climate, but the people are a little different than me. So I, I did it in an interview. But if you're going to retire, I recommend you choose a perfect climate, okay, the best you can. But uh, the other thing you got to do when you're retiring is choose something um, according to your age in a way. Some people need to be closer to the airports. I mean, so because they might want to be able to come home quickly or they want to. Why do, why do people retire in Central and South America? Why do Americans retire in Central and South America? Get there back. Easier to get cheaper. Still missing the, one of the best answers, guys. It's the same time zone. <laughs> okay, so that means when you call your children at home, you're not calling them at midnight. When you're in Thailand, it's 12 hours difference. It's really difficult to. I, I, I said this story the other night. I was in in uh, uh, Caribbean, and uh, I was in uh, Sosua, Dominican Republic. And I was talking to Kevin. I said, why don't you go hang out in Thailand? It's perfect for you. There's girls there. There's girls here. You know, it's one of, he's one of these girl chasers. And he said, he said, who wants to watch basketball at midnight? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, okay, you're right. You do watch basketball 24 hours a day. You watch all the sports. And, but, but a lot of people that are trying to do online uh, inner businesses go south so that they can stay talking on Skype. At the, you, know, you can run your business stay in the same time zone. And I kept trying to tell him when I came home from Vilcabamba, I said, I don't have jet lag. It's only one hour difference. It's not jet lag. Because they think but jet lag is when you're, you know, living in Thailand and you suddenly twelve hours difference and you know you're staying up all night. Uh, I if to retire abroad, um, you really have to choose a city. And I I think the way to prepare to retire abroad and just to <coughs> take the possibility that you think you might want to do it. You, you don't just jump and retire abroad. Why don't you take off a month, two months, and go live someplace up outside the United States and then all the problems that there will be will, with your house and how to move and stuff will become evident. You can make a list of all the problems and then you can get a, uh, a taste of it. Do this two or three times and then make the jump. I, I really think that a lot of the uh, travel writers and a lot of the websites and stuff are really negligent here. They're acting like you're just going to, it's like moving from Ohio to Indiana, you just buy a new house, you buy a new car, you get a new, it's nothing like that. That's, that's negligence. That's really, uh, you're always, you're always going to be having problems. So, uh, but the best way to do it is uh, choose a spot and jump stay there for a couple of months and it's not easy. Again, you can use the Lonely Planet to, to, as a, a budget. You can price out the rooms on Lonely Planet. Uh, the internet's almost horrible for this. Think I, I have over a hundred websites. <coughs> we have a hundred websites which I consider the 100 best places to hang out on the planet. 
and I still use the the guidebook. I bought Europe, Southeast Europe, uh, Lonely Planet, Southeastern Europe, because <coughs> it's the only information that's somebody they paid them to write that, and they're not earning a commission, so they're not telling me a lie to get me to go in the room. So, like, I don't. I always see TripAdvisor. I said, TripAdvisor. Oh, twice the cost. <laughs> Whenever I see that on the front of the window, I almost go to another hotel because that just means it's popular, trendy, and expensive. Uh, and and they, a lot of these reviews are gained. I mean, they're, they they have people they say come write about my hotel. And, you know, they say hey, I'll give you a free room if you write something nice about my hotel. Um, Can you just go live in another country now? Yeah. Have Americans just live there. Don't you think you need a visa and then you get it again? Well, most countries give you. 90 days on arrival. I mean, it, there's, I would say on average, the average visa is 90 days. I often... So you can't live like the rest of your life somewhere? Well, some countries you can. Somewhere. Some countries, like... Uh, I hope the won't. <laughs> but I, I told this the other day, I said, if you, if you read travel websites, they're always talking about the visas, talking to the attorney, the resident visa. <coughs> Excuse me. They're talking about... Uh, uh, buying real estate, and these are, to me, the scams. Okay, uh, and I'll give an example about the, uh, Visa. If Bill Gates went over to India and he started the factory, and he wanted to live there, they're going to give him a visa, and they're going to give him a way to buy a car, and they're going to be able to let him live there, right? Any country on the planet, there is a way to live in that country. So choosing a country only for the visa, to me, is silliness. Uh, choose the country that you want to live in, and then the visa will work its way out. Okay, I mean, there's always, it, it's serendipitous. Travel is, we, we act like everybody's making all these rules so we can't go there, but actually, they want us there and they want us to spend the money, and there's always, you know, you, you sit there and you're, on, you're in the country and all of a sudden you go, oh, like I was in the Dominican Republic last year, and I go, well, how do you guys stay here so long? He says, oh, they just let us overstay. They, they make us pay like $30. And he says, well, how long can you overstay? I don't know, a year, I guess, two years. Nobody knew, really, because they always would leave or something. But they had just this kind of a, nobody cared if they overstayed their visa. But I, I don't really recommend that much. But it, there are countries where they do that. And you can just stay there. And uh, unfortunately, there are countries, like I just knew a guy in Thailand that spent, 11 years overstay. He stayed over and stayed his visa <laughs> for 11 years. Because they never kick you out. They never ask you why you're there. You're an illegal alien, just like... Uh, there, there is a way. Uh, in Lake Atalan, where I go to a lot, um, they actually have a... He's a really good expat place. has a like a visa office. And you just go hand them your passport and say, extend it, give them $50, and somehow... You got another 90 days. <laughs> okay. But uh, being a snowbird is an uh, excellent way to travel, especially, you know, uh, where you're spending half the, you know. I, I've been trying for years to convince my friend Mike to uh, just come to the tropics wherever I'm at and spend six months. I said, it's, you're gonna, it's cheaper to live outside the United States than it is to live inside the United States. Uh, of the 200 downhill countries, uh, the average income a, a day is somewhere between five and ten, uh, fifteen dollars a day. So when you're earning five and fifteen dollars a day, that means that you pe people live at five. And, you know, my friend uh, said, "Well, you can't live in Medellin, Colombia, for less than two thousand." I said, "Come on, roll back." and said, "Ninety-nine percent of the people in the country are." <laughs> <laughs> and you got to think about it. There's a lot of people that are going to get on Social Security. And if they're, we call them ec economic refugees. Uh, the guy that's got $800 coming in, he's between a rock and a hard place. And a lot of these people end up in, uh, in some of these places. And because uh, I regularly, like I just lived in, uh, I've lived in most cities where I live and I pay less than $200 a month for my, my room. And it's uh, like I had an apartment in Africa for $70 a month. And you can, you know, you think, and I had one of the most expensive apartments in the city, <laughs> okay? It was kind of funny because I was laughing because everybody thought I was rich and I thought, 
How can you be rich paying $70 a month? <laughs> it was a beautiful apartment, brand new. Um, have you traveled to the area, and how is it of like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and that area? Yeah, they think they call those the Baltic states. Yes. The Baltic states. Baltic I, I was in, uh, yeah, I was there. Uh, wonderful place. Very difficult to talk to them because <laughs> they don't speak English that well. Uh, but again, I was in Estonia one time. I mean, Estonia, Riga, Latvia is a big party city for, for Europe. Great place, very cultural. And then uh, I worked my way up to uh, Estonia, and then I, worked, uh, I went back to Vil Vilnius, Lithuania. Um, some of the most beautiful girls on the planet are in that uh, <laughs> Lithuania. <laughs> <laughs> platinum blonde hair. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to be just south of there in a couple of months. I'm going to be south of Romania, and you know, you got. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a little cold. Those are the Baltic states. They're real nice. I, I'll never forget. I was paying twenty-two dollars in uh, what's that this city in uh, Estonia. Well, I was in the capital, and for a hostel bed, I I got on the bus and I did like I normally do, just go fifty miles and hop off the bus end up in the city and I paid six euros for a room. So a lot of the times the rooms can be really cheap outside of these places. Now the, but the tourist <coughs> is can be the most expensive. So you really got to think just, you got to be savvy here to think why is this expensive and why wouldn't this be expensive? And you'll, you'll find that most people just are following the same path. And they, and I, I get off the path all the time. Um, <coughs> One of my best ways of traveling is I just get on the bus, I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, I get on the bus by 7, I go two hours, I hop off the bus when the bus stops for some reason, and I stay for three or four days. <laughs> and it's a really, really... Do you feel safe? Oh, yeah, yeah. Most places? Well, most places. I mean, uh, contrary to what you think, the world is a, a very safe place. Uh, they're not as dangerous. And I've been to Iraq. I have a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. You're going back to Istanbul, Turkey, and I know you've been there. Are you going to go back to Iraq? <laughs> no. <laughs> no plans to go back to I don't have the money, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you, when you go, I, I went to Iraq right after the heavy fighting ended in 2002. <laughs> I spent 30 days going from land. I came in from, I flew into Istanbul, went to Salopi, Turkey. Waited until I got brave enough to cross the border. Crossed the border, went over to Dohok, where I found out all these GIs were having their vacations. It's a vacation city for the Iraqi war thing, the R&R, &R, I guess. And then I went over to Mosul, where they're actually bombing right now, or the Mosul Dam. And then I went by land to, no, I went over to Arbil, went over to Sulaymaniyah, came back to Arbil, went down to Mosul, which is when you actually leave the Kurdistan part. There's two countries here. I don't know if you know it, but there's really two countries in Iraq. There's a border even. It's the Kurdish part, and then you got the Arabic part. And then when you go to the Mosul, that's when you go into the Arabic part. And I went over to Kirkuk, where they, then I went straight to Baghdad, and then all the way down to Basra. Spent 30 days there. But uh, when 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 you go to, uh, if everybody buys my book, I might go to Iraq. These books are for sale. Don't buy his book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, when you when you go to a dangerous place, uh, I'm National Geographic adventure traveler, okay, and that's because I go to places like Iraq. I've been to Haiti. I was in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, when it broke out in the war. Any. I mean, I would go to Afghanistan right now in a second if I had an extra four thousand dollars in my pocket. But you got to—you can't go in poor in these places. You got to really. Uh, have you been to Israel? Excuse me. Have you been to Israel? Yeah, yeah. I was—I uh, call it the unholy lands. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a safe place to travel? With you? Uh, yeah, you got to watch it because as an American, even they don't pass stamp your passport because uh, they won't let you go to the next country over, maybe. But uh, I had no problem there. It's kind of fun. To, I'll never forget, I was, my friend met me at the airport, Tel Aviv airport. I got off the train. I, I, they got a train that goes to the airport, like many airports. And we don't do it as much in America, but most world puts an airport right to the, uh, a train that goes to the airport. 
I come into Tel Aviv, I get off the train, and there's this girl, beautiful girl with a machine gun in her hand, and I go, ooh! And he goes, what? I said, that's something special there. <laughs> because you got these girls, everybody in, in, in Israel is walking around with a, a, a gun, because they're all in the after army. They have to, after, after you know, they all have to go to the uh, service. Um, Israel, you know, Tel Aviv is a great beach town. Um, which I don't think you hear that much, but I think it was one of the best beach towns I've ever been to. Um, I got on a, and I went to Jerusalem, and I stayed in the, I'll, I'll never forget it, it was when Gaza was being given away, and all the, uh, we were staying in this hostel, this Iceland girl dragged me there. She didn't really have to work very hard. <laughs> but I was in Tel Aviv, and she says, you had to go to Jerusalem. I said, I'll go anywhere. And so I went to Jerusalem, but, uh, the sad part about it is uh, it's very political, and everybody's talking politics. And they, you know, you have people that go to Israel. You have people that go to Israel to complain about Israel, which the hostel I was in was one of these types of hostels. And it was like, why would you go to a country just to sit around and complain? But they do. And I also learned that they give uh, uh, what was it? I mean, they actually give scholarships to Americans, so the idea that they will immigrate to Israel. This is what's causing this, uh, you know, new new territories to be, housing to be built. And they're doing it. I mean, I'm sitting there and you can see five or six Americans around you in uh, Tel Aviv and go, what are you here for? Oh, they paid me fifteen thousand, you know, $1,500 if I would just come over here and check it out. And so they're trying to, they're trying to bring more Jewish people there. But uh, it's a very political place. It's a very beautiful place in some ways, but I mean, it's very dry. But the, the great part about the Israelis uh, is they're very intelligent people. And I mean, if you look at the list of Nobel, if you really want to know if a country is very smart, check out how many Nobel Peace, how, ma how many Nobel Prizes they got. And you sit there and go, you know, Israel's got a lot. Good. What you're saying about Israel is so very true. I have a friend who is an Israeli and she talks about it. She's a world traveler as well. Yep. And Tel Aviv is a part of town. The young oh, yeah. people love the club there. And Jerusalem then is divided, of course. Sure. And it's a bit dangerous. That's dangerous right now. Yeah, right. And even before the bombing started, if a Jewish person would mm -hmm. accidentally cross over to the Arab side. But, um, yeah, they are very political. And you're right about intelligence. Uh, when she comes to America, she's scrutinized. <coughs> Why are you going there? Because she said that they have been exporting too many brains. Sure. <laughs> that they are losing their brains. Yeah, their brains. So I am very interested in hearing that now they're inviting <coughs> Americans over there. I did not know that. Oh yeah, they, they, when you're sitting in a hostel, you see all these young kids that, that they pay to bring them there. Yeah, um, you can go on vacation from there, but do not get a job in America, sure. because we may lose you. Sure. Yeah. Well, Israelis, out, I, there's a thing in the traveler slang called after army, which if you say Israeli after army, that means they went in the army for two years, three years, whatever, then they, they go for traveling for your, and it's the, the culture, the custom, they all go. So, I mean, you'll see, Israelis going in swarms all through Central and South America, heading you when know, Carnival in Brazil, they're all going for Brazil. Um, I like Israelis; uh, they're very intelligent people, but they're also very aggressive, which is which I I respect because I think sometimes what's lacking in America is the uh, fortitude. Okay, I mean you, when when everybody had to go to the service, when they got out of the service, they were a man. And you got the men and the girls of Israel. They're, you know, they're, they're broad. They're, they're, they're not, they're not wimps. Yeah. How do you deal with the language barriers when you travel? Well, uh, it's, you know, first word you learn is man, 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 man. I got to yeah. think, in, think in English. Uh, <laughs> Spanish. I was thinking in Spanish. Uh, the first word you learn is toilet. <laughs> okay, but the word toilet almost always. Is yes, we, I always laugh when the Europeans get tired and say, well, you, you don't really go in the restroom to rest, do you? No, I, I go to the toilet, okay. 
because they don't like me to say restroom, the Europeans. Um, I'm, I truly recommend that everybody pay real close attention and try to learn how to say hello and thank you and the manners things. Excuse me. I always like to know how to say excuse me, please. Thank you. Um, when you're when you're dealing with like Arabic country, here's a tough thing. I mean, uh, when I want to buy something, I have a calculator that I carry in my backpack. It's right in my little pouch all the time, and then I'll type in the number, and we'll we'll get them to do it. Then you have to be able to calculate the exchange of money too. So so, uh, but buying stuff is the most risky thing about a language, so you have to know the number. So we'll always get them to type that in or write it down. So I always, you know, I always have a, I can actually carry index cards with me. I've done it for 30 years, and then just have them write it down and write the prices down. Um, the, the tough countries are things like China, Russia, uh, you know, Thailand. I mean, Thai can, Thailand can be very difficult. There's, there's, but the big places that are really tough are China is always in Arabic countries. And, I, and when I'm in the hotel, first thing I do is I make sure I have a business card. I get a bit because I gotta get back to the place, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I always make sure I have a business card or two business cards. And hopefully they didn't do this crazy thing where they put it in English to try to help the tourists, because it's not gonna do me a darn bit of good, right? I hate when people give me the, the address in English and I go, they don't speak English in China, they speak Chinese. I want it all in Chinese except one word that says the name of the hotel. Okay, maybe it's a telephone number. Then I get this card and if they don't have that, I make them write it in the local language. And then I start roaming around the city. But normally, um, you, you need to um, stay by the transportation so that uh, I, if you're on... If you're in a tough place like China or something like this, uh, there's major highways, so you follow that major highway there and follow it back. And because otherwise, there's always people that are loving to find, love to find people that are just afraid and lost and whatever. And like when I was in South Korea, we, I never left the, the subway. <laughs> I mean, I never got more than about 50 feet, 50 yards away from the subway, and I go right back to it because I couldn't find my way back to the hotel. I mean, it's the only way. I can get back. And they, they actually have a service there where you handle a cell phone. The low, if you live there long enough, like the people teach us English over there, they actually have a phone line. You can, you can call this number and you tell them what you want to do and they actually tell the taxi driver. So you hand the cell phone to the taxi driver and do it. But uh, learning, learning a language, I don't really recommend you either don't learn the language or you learn the language. Uh, the Spanish, the, the countries with Roman characters, like Vietnam's got Roman characters, Thailand doesn't. I mean, any country with Roman characters where you can actually sound out the words is going to be a lot easier. Uh, Spanish countries, they're all easy. Most of Europe's relatively easy. Where I'm going right now, it's going to be pretty difficult. Uh, but you have to be patient, right? So, um, what I do at, at a hotel, normally there's a person in the hotel that'll do it. Like when we were in Iraq, it's all Arabic, so we actually, we, there was a guy that had lived in England, and he was in, Bag, he was in Baghdad, so we were trying to go to Babylon, and we tried to do all these different places, and so what we'd have the guy do is write down all these destinations in Arabic, and then right next to it, we'd write the word in English, so we wouldn't get mixed up. you got to make sure you have both of them, because just a list of Arabic words doesn't make any sense. And then you show it to the taxi driver, and they'll take it. Um, now, um, the other way to deal with the language problems is to, to get your own taxi, which we don't really think about this in America, but in, in a country, a lot of countries, you can get a taxi for $25 a day, okay? And you just say, this is my taxi. And then you, you get him to come to the hotel, and then you talk with the owner and then somebody in the hotel that speaks English and then you give the list and then uh, hopefully do it. Or what you can do is just be a real, uh, I mean, I, I had a name for this, I used to do it. I'll walk around and talk to people. 
And if you walk, just walked up to a taxi driver and start mumbling away in English, you go walk up to ten of them, start, one of them's going to reply. So they say there's a group of taxi drivers. And you just walk up and say, Hello, how are you guys? You all look kind of funny today. <laughs> and they, they, one of them might say, I do. Uh, I remember I was in Thailand. I was sitting there. I said, I want the big fat donut. I don't want that little donut. They were cooking donuts. And this guy says, later in the day, this guy comes up and he says, why, why do you just keep, you talking in English by yourself? I says, I figure I got it. I'm